I'm uh, Professor Greg Kennedy from the Defense Studies Department, one of Nick's colleagues, and it's a great pleasure for me to be here tonight to introduce him and uh, his new book. And with us tonight, we have uh, also his uh, publisher, Daniel Crew, and uh, Nick is uh, going to do about 20 minutes or so, and uh, then open it up to a bit of Q&A. So I hope you enjoy the evening. And uh, again, thank you very much for taking the time to be uh, with us. So Nick Lloyd's a reader here in the Defense Studies Department in Military and Imperial History at King's College London. And uh, we're based out at the Defense Academy in Shrivenham. He's a widely published historian of the Great War and has written on uh, many histories on the Battle of Luz, the Hundred Days, as well as Passchendaele. And today we're here for the launch uh, of the first in a, a trilogy, The Western Front, in the first book uh, in that. He joins us today then uh, via Zoom, obviously, and can uh, discuss the book for a bit and then uh, open it up. He's going to tell you about his kind of aims and objectives with the book and what he hopes to achieve with it. And then he'll be happy to take any questions. Can I ask, uh, please, if you can ask uh, your questions uh, using the Q&A function? And we'll, we'll start there and then uh, we'll see how the day progresses and we may move over to the raise hand function, depending on how many people we have coming in. So I'm going to ask uh, Daniel to uh, take over to the microphone and uh, he has a bit of stuff he wants to tell you about the, the book and publishing. So Daniel, over to you. Thanks, Greg. Yes. Hi, I'm uh, Daniel Crew. I'm publishing director at Viking, part of Penguin Random House. Um, and I want to say how thrilled that I am and how thrilled we all are to be publishing Nick's book today, The Western Front. And in this virtual world that we're living in at the moment, it gives me particularly great pleasure to actually be able to hold up a physical copy of the book and show you. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, Nick, as he always does, has dug deep into the documents on all sides and especially has looked at the leaders to produce an account that is comprehensive and gripping and often moving. And perhaps most remarkably, he's managed to create a single narrative out of the huge number of people and places and events that make up the Western Front. As a brief footnote, he's done this while keeping to the contracted length and delivery date, which uh, publishers will tell you isn't always the case with authors. So Nick is a model author, and maybe you think I'm bound to say that because I'm the publisher, but I can point you to the review in the Times. Um, that said Nick Lloyd has written a tour de force of scholarship, analysis and narration. Lloyd is well on the way to writing a definitive history of the First World War. And as Greg said, um, indeed, we're thrilled that Nick's writing um, also in the trilogy on the Eastern Front and the wider war. So I hope uh, next time um, we can raise a glass in person. But in the meantime, tonight, um, rather than selling the book here, I will post a link to the book in the chat function in a moment, and I will raise a glass over Zoom and say cheers to Nick. And now over to you. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, thanks for coming. Obviously, as Daniel said, it would be very much very nice to do this uh, in person, but uh, Zoom offers us different uh, functionality and. Uh, it's uh, it's great to be able to do this. So yeah, no, we, <clears throat> this is a big day. You know, this is the the volume I have in my hand. It's um, a very handsome volume, and it's it's big. It's it's heavy. It's really really thick. As you can see, it's it's a fair it's a fair chunk of text. And uh, yeah, I started in in uh, 2017. Um, I'd finished the book on Passchendaele, which I know some of you may have read. Um, and you know, we were going back and forth about what to do and um, you know, I thought we need to do something bigger and uh, something more general and the Western Front opened up really and I thought as soon as I sort of came into my head, it wasn't one of those sort of, um, you know, I woke up from a dream, but I woke up one morning and I thought there was something, something going on there. So I thought we should do the Western Front because there's no, there isn't, in my view, any really particularly strong histories of the Western Front as a whole. Uh, there are a handful of books that concentrate solely on the Western Front in the First World War. Um, but again, I think they have limitations and I think there were a number of things I wanted to, to do with this, um, which was really to tell the story from all of the main sides. So we've got 
you know, you've got the Germans in there, you've got the French in there, you've got the British in there, and you've got the Americans in there. So you've got the whole package. And to go through all of those different perspectives uh, was really what I wanted to do. So, you know, I think a lot of the books on the Western Front are essentially campaign or battle histories. You now, I've done this, you know, I've written on Passchendaele, I've written on Luz. You get a lot of books on the Somme, you get a couple of books on Verdun, you get books on 1918 books on 1915, books on 1914, but often um, there, there aren't books that go through the whole campaign, the whole four years of the Western Front. So I thought that would be a really, really cool thing to do. Um, and again, to incorporate the entire picture. So we have the whole French war, we have the German war, we have the British war, and we have the American war. And so you see the whole thing emerge and I wanted to write a narrative history, and I'm very fortunate with my publisher that they let me do what I wanted to do, uh, which is which is very rare and very welcome. So I'm very glad that Daniel allowed me to do what I wanted to do, which is really to write a narrative of the of the military operational side of things. So it focuses solely really on the war that is fought, the generals, the technology, um, the tactics, the strategy, and tells that story over four years. And I think that was really interesting for me because I'd concentrated on elements of the Western Front, but having to do the whole thing. So what you'll see is the book is split into three sections. The first section begins in August 1914 and goes to basically the end of 1915. And that is a predominantly German French struggle. The British are in it a little bit. Um, they get slightly more important as 1915 goes on, but broadly it's the French and the Germans. The second part uh, takes you from uh, the beginning of 1916. Um, so you have a whole of 1916 and you begin to see the balance start to shift. So the British become more important as their army grows and as the French rely on them much more. Um, and you go through Verdun, you go through Somme, those great big attritional trench battles that, you know, have so sort of captured the imagination of people uh, had become synonymous with trench warfare and the First World War. And the second part ends with the Nivelle Offensive in April and May of 1917. Now, this is a part I found particularly fascinating because it's when the French realise they are running out of men and they're really going to struggle, but they... They have a new commander in chief, Robert Nivelle, who seems to have something. He seems to have an ability to get results. So he is brought in um, and that a lot of faith is placed in Nivelle. Uh, and of course, Nivelle um, gets things quite badly wrong and leaves the, uh, the French army really on a knife edge in the spring of 1917. And it's at that point where the Allies really on the Western Front are on the verge of, of collapse. Um, and you have the twin shifts of the Russian Revolution and the American entry, which really changed the balance in the war. But the French really hit a low point in the spring of 1917, we have the mutinies of the French army. And then we have the final part of the book, uh, which is the longest part of the book. And that takes you from the spring, well, sort of the early summer of 1917, all the way to the armistice in November 1918. And this begins with the arrival of General John Pershing, the American commander in chief in France. So it marks a different shift where the French, the British, and now the Americans are, are working out what they need to do, how they're going to fight. And they don't agree on pretty much anything. And then you have the final act of the Western Front, which is the German Spring Offensive of 1918. This is where things come full circle, where the German, German army have tried to win in 1940 and not, just failed. They haven't got to Paris. They haven't broken the French army. But now... The Russians are out of the war. There is a window of opportunity for the Germans to strike. And that is what they do. They say, we've got to strike now before the Americans are in strength. So they, they kick off in March 1918. And that's the sort of final phase of the war where you see the war really changing and developing a lot in 1918. So, and that, of course, all goes all the way to the armistice. So I think there was, you know, there's a number of things I wanted to do with the book, which was concentrate, you know, on the generals and that operational level of war. Um, how they coped. And I think there are a number of things people will hopefully get from the book is the, is the scale of the challenge in the First World War for, for all sides. You know, they're coping with, you know, an enormous array of challenges, technological challenges, um, difficulties of logistics, difficulties of trying to work out what they should be doing. And, um, you know, actually 
what I want people to do really if, if they read the book is to essentially put themselves in the position of those generals and just think, you know, how would I have done it? How would I have gone about breaking the stalemate? What would I have done? And there'll be people you like in there. There'll be people you dislike in the book. Um, there'll be people you think you like, and then you, they turn out to get it all wrong. And so I think the characters of the individuals was really something I wanted to get across because I think too often the generals are seen as rather sort of cardboard cutout figures without personality or without character or without um, sort of, you know, family and, and, and sort of a, an emotional life. And you do see that with a number of individuals in the book. Um, and I think trying to bring these people to life, I think is essential. We can judge them, of course, um, some of them do really well, some of them do really badly, some of them just sort of muddle along. Um, but you'd see it all in the span of the four years. And I think one of the strengths of the book is that if you're doing an individual campaign study or battle study, you don't get this. But if you're doing the whole span of the Western Front, you see people cut, rise and fall. Um, so people come in really strong and they burn out and get sacked and they go away. You never hear from them. Other people gradually build a career and a reputation and then lose it, or they, um, they don't do very well, they don't do very well, and suddenly they, they get it right towards the end of the war. So you do see the rise and fall. It's almost like a kind of Game of Thrones um, where you see the rivalries, you see the, the fortune that smiles on certain individuals and not others. And so you get that with the kind of study that I did, again, over the four years. So. You know, I hope people get from the book just a, a narrative where you can you can sort of go and see and sit beside the generals as they try and work out, you know, how they're going to cope with these problems, how they're going to achieve what they need to achieve, the pressures that they're under. Um, and again, some of them do well, some of them don't do very well. But I think we wouldn't necessarily be any different now if, if we were in that situation. So. It was great fun to write. It was really challenging. Um, but, I, you know, I hope people just get a, a real sense of what the war was like for those individuals and they can make their own minds up. They can go through it and then say, well, you know, who do I think was the best or who do I think was the worst? So, you know, it was really fun to write. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm cracking on now with Eastern Front. Uh, so we're, we're moving to volume two, uh, which I was really pleased to do. That was they didn't emerge immediately as soon as we got the contract through for, for western front and i started getting into it, i thought you know what um I, i've got to do i've got to do the whole thing now so i think the, the next uh, logical step was the eastern front which again is not a war that i've i've had any real experience of i know the western front quite well but eastern front is a totally different uh kettle of fish but absolutely a completely different war in many ways but a war that was uh Again, really central to what was going on between those years, and then of course we'll we'll look to to the you know expand out further to the war in Africa and the Middle East. So that's the sort of plan, really. So, you know, I guess the whole the whole idea is to produce three individual volumes. You can read these volumes, um, you know, individually, but hopefully together they will produce a, a comprehensive history of the war. So. You know, that's really what I've tried to do. And um, yeah, it's wonderful. I mean, any author will know once you get your hands on a copy of the actual real thing, it's, it's a real fantastic moment. So it's, um, yeah, I'm really pleased, really pleased. And uh, it's great to be able to share this with you. So um, enough of me. Um, if you have questions, you can put them in the q and I think we have already a few. And then once we've gone through the Q&A questions, we can have some hands up if you have any. Okay, we've got some questions. I'll try and deal with them. Is the Belgian side covered? Well, the Belgians are covered a little bit. The best Belgians get covered in the early phase of the war. So you, uh, the, the first chapter in, uh, includes the bombardment of Liège and the capture of um, Gerard Le Mans, who was the defender of Liège. So the, Liège, the Belgians are involved in the early stages, uh, but then of course they, they take a, a real secondary seat to the, if you like, the major powers on the Western Front, the, uh, the French predominantly, then the British, and then of course the Americans. I think it's very important to include the Americans as well. Um, and the other forces involve Russian, Italian, Portuguese. Well, you won't find too much of them. I do get 
I do get a mention of the Portuguese. The Portuguese Expeditionary Force is sent to the Western Front in 1917, and they do play a rather infamous role in 1918, which I won't go into too much detail, but they are in there. Um, there are two, I think, two brigades of Russians that, that go on the Western Front in 1917. Um, didn't have space to cover them, unfortunately, given how, I mean, I don't know how many brigades are on the Western Front, but uh, covering individual brigades is quite different. It's quite difficult when I can't even cover armies, entire armies on the book, but um, there we go. Um, Alan, all right, so my question, which of the generals does Nick like and dislike having got to know them so well? Um, well, the thing, if you do read the book uh, without sort of trying to spoil things, I think, um, you know, I think there are a few generals I think really, really do very well. I think um, my, my admiration for Herbert Plumer is, is, is very clear. You, you read my Passchendaele book, you'll know that. I think he's really, really good. Um, of the French generals, I think there's a few that really stand out. Um, I think you've got to say Ferdinand Foch. I think he's, he's, he's something about him which uh, really is quite strong. There's, there's, a, there's a kind of, um, there's a steel within his character, which means he can carry on and broadly get it right. And I think that's really the test of these generals. Can they get it right basic? Can they get it most of it right at the time? Can they make the big calls? And I think Foch does. I've got a great deal of admiration also for the French commander in chief, Philippe Pétain, who you know, was a national hero in the war for his defense of Verdun, but he does bring something different to French generalship. And he has a, he has a way with things, which is remarkable. He has a a kind of a real feel for what you can and cannot do in trench warfare. Uh, you're not going to be able to achieve certain things. And by 1915, he knows pretty much that the French cannot break through, which is one of the big themes of the book. He knows they can't do it. So he advocates attacking trench lines, just securing trench lines, moving the guns up and doing it much more slowly and in an avowedly attritional manner. So Petain wants to kill Germans, not break through, because he doesn't think they can do it. And you see these two debates quite strongly. Um, and it, it filters through to the British as well. So you have people like Rawlinson, who commands Fourth Army on the Somme. Uh, it comes to the same conclusions as Petain around the same time, a little bit later, um, that they can't break through. They need to do something different. So if, if I find this dichotomy really fascinating. So I think, you know, Petain's problem is he gets too pessimistic in 1918, whereas Foch is not. So those two are real kind of poles apart. I think one of the French generals once said that if you could fuse Foch and Petain together, you'd have the perfect general. Uh, but of course you, you can't. Um, okay, um, got actually loads of questions. Um, what was the most surprising thing you learned from your research for this book? Um, I don't know really. Um, I mean, I think I'm pretty, you know, I'm, I, I know a bit about the Western Front. I've written a few books on it. So I was kind of aware of, of, of what I wanted to do. I think, uh, you know, I think the extent of the French war effort is, is important to bear in mind that, you know, what, what they were trying to do and how well they did and how, you know, the burden that they played and the burden they, they have for so long, I think, which, which English language audiences have never really appreciated, I think. Uh, so I was always aware of that. And, and, you know, I wanted to bring that out in the book because, so that was really fascinating for me to learn about the French army and really trying to get into that sort of side of things. Um, <clears throat> Indians, and what is your view on them generally? Well, the Indian Corps, of course, plays a, an important role in 1914 and 1915 in, uh, you know, holding the line at a particularly perilous moment. So the Indian Corps, you know, play a vital role in, in stabilizing the Western Front uh, uh, in the British Expeditionary Force, and, and that should never be forgotten. And uh, they are justly remembered for that. Uh, there was no other troops available to the British Empire and it just goes to show how stretched the British were in that early period of the war, where they, they start from a very small reserve of manpower or trained manpower and have to expand rapidly. So, you know, if you think in the before the war at the Staff College, they had like blue sky thinking plans about how many divisions the British would fight in war. This is like 1912. And the the, the case study the example is six divisions. That's the most you'd ever deploy. 
Um, by 1916, the British had got 60 divisions. So they're just pff, mass expansion. Nobody knows what they're doing, but anyway. Um, uh, do I draw any conclusions at the end? Well, I like to think that I do, but I, I, again, I, I don't want to overface the reader in a way. And I do think it's up to readers themselves to make their own minds up about these generals and about the war. And I do think it is important to, to just let the story tell itself without trying to fix a big argument on the book. I think people need to reflect on it and you know, just think what, what they do. And if they want to be critical of the generals or the war, that's absolutely fine. Um, you know, I just wanted to tell the story as I saw it really and, and let that, you know, let that kind of just wash over people and see, see how it goes. How about the forces of the Dominions, Canada in particular, and their leader, Curry? Well, um, you know, I've written on this before, and I think I have a great admiration for Curry, who commanded the Canadian Corps in, uh, in late 1917 and 1918. He's probably one of the best generals of the war. Obviously, he doesn't get to uh, army level, like not command of an army. You could argue that Canadians are kind of an army, but... Um, so he's not tested at the very highest levels, but that's hardly his fault. What he does is very, very good. And I think what Curry has is like what Petain has, which is a wonderful feel for what infantry can achieve and cannot achieve on the battlefield. And I think some commanders, which again, you'll meet in the book, don't have that. They just don't really have the feel or the touch of the battlefield. And I think that the best commanders on the Western Front do, and they know immediately what the, the limits to which they can push their units. And I think that's a really important element of, of any general, uh, but particularly in the First World War. Ben, uh, the British army uh, that beat the Germans in the Hundred Days was greatly transformed from the BEF at Mons in 1914. What do you think was the success factors that enabled this remarkable adaptation? Well, I think that's a great question. and. I think there's a whole range of factors, which again, we can't get into here, but it's a sort of, it's a culmination of a whole revolution in military affairs, uh, the, uh, you know, the development of tanks, the continued evolution of air power, the integration of artillery, a kind of imagination. And I always think it's always worth remembering that the British show an inventiveness and a ruthlessness and a determination in the First World War that they very rarely show since or before they really get it right in 1918. So I think there's a number of factors which produces this adaptation and innovation. It's the lessons of hard struggles, the willingness to try, the willingness to actually put a lot of these things into practice that they learned. Um, so I think there's a, you know, again, other people have written on innovation in the First World War than I, than I myself. So I think that's definitely worth thinking about if you'd like to learn more about it. But yeah, there's lots of stuff going on and it just sort of clicks in 1918 uh, where it hadn't clicked for so long. It finally, it finally goes well. They know what they're doing in 1918. They know what can be achieved. They know what can't be achieved. They don't, in earlier years, they didn't know that, so. Um, <clears throat> Peter, uh, Haig is a very controversial figure. Which side do you come down on without giving too much away? Yes, Haig is very controversial, the most controversial commander in British military history, if not all military history. Um, I have been critical of Haig. So, you know, if, if, if people are, you know, are thinking that it's gonna to be too pro Haig or too anti Haig, I, I, I tend to come down sort of in the middle on Haig. Haig is not one of my favorite commanders. And certainly when I started researching the First World War, I, w I wanted to like Haig. I wanted to be able to adopt a kind of very defensive position on Haig. Um, but my, my line on Haig, you'll find this in my Passchendaele book. I think Haig has many strengths. He's strong, he's determined. He is, you know, he, he is not like, he's not morally fragile or emotional. He's strong, firm, committed, works very hard, has a good grasp of the army. But I think fundamentally, Haig doesn't really ever get the battlefields. And I contrast him quite strongly with, with Curry. Now, Curry comes to the Western Front with, like his background is not like Haig's. He was a 
failed real estate broker and a teacher. Um, he comes to the Western Front and he goes, right, I need to learn. So I'm going to get all the best people around me and I need to learn what it's like because I don't know what it's like. So his mind is open and he sucks all the information in and he realizes very quickly that the Western Front is all about logistics, preparation, artillery fire. So he, he gets it all in. Haig approaches the Western Front from the perspective that I, I, have, I know everything about war. I have been trained. I, I know it. So whatever is out there must conform to what I know. So therefore, this is what we need to do. And if out there reality doesn't conform to it, then we just keep going. So Haig's is a very different perspective. And I think that's why Haig struggles sometimes because there's no real excuse for the first day on the Somme. I call that one of the great mistakes of the war uh, where he's, he's just far too ambitious and over optimistic about what can be achieved. And this is, I've discussed this about Haig in my Lose book, which is the difficult thing about Haig is that on the one hand, he writes reports where he's very clear on the, um, the limitations of what the British have. We don't have enough guns. We don't have trained manpower. The enemy's defenses are very, 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 very you know, difficult. And then a week later, he's talking about breaking the line and the cavalry are going to go through to Lille. And so you have this real shift with Haig, which I think has been underappreciated. So I think Haig has strengths, but I don't think he's one of the great commanders of the war. Uh, that's, that's my perspective. I think there are other better commanders. If, if, but again, um, Haig has his defenders, and I suspect he always will. Um, but I leave that to you guys to see what you think. Um, Simon, you said that you focus at the operational level. Um, have you been able to draw any conclusions as to whether the Allies understood and were able to conduct operational art during the final campaigns of 1918? Yeah, I wrote an article on this for British Army Review. Um, yep, operational art exists in 1918 and the British and the French and the Americans do it and they do it uh, significantly better than the Germans. They're able to coordinate lots of different activity into a operational model which works. So I think there's no doubt about it. Some people um, say that operational art does not exist in the First World War. This is not true. Uh, it does exist. And it, uh, by 1918, you see the, the origins of real sort of modern, modern operational art. Uh, what are your views on the war in the air? Was it relevant? Absolutely. It's vital. It's really, really important. Indeed, it's probably been underplayed. The importance of the air has been... Um, probably underestimated in histories of the war uh, and I was very conscious of trying to put more emphasis on the air because by 1918 you can't do a lot without air power it's remarkable so you know the British the the, the Royal Air Force they are photographing the British sector of the Western Front twice a day every day by 1918 uh, and that's all fully integrated with artillery and infantry so um it's remarkable. So the, the role that air plays is crucial. And I, I, I think that's a great question. That's a great point. Um, uh, Mark, did your opinions of the generals change at all in the course of the writing of the book? Um, yeah, I think I was pretty open-minded in terms of, you know, I've, I'm well aware of the debates pro and against of the generals. There were some generals that I thought I, I would, I really wanted to like, I really wanted to be better than maybe they were. Um, I got a soft spot for Robert Nivelle, which you might find in the book. I, you know, he, he's a commander that we desperately need a modern study of. I kind of felt very sorry for him because he gets it wrong uh, in 1917 and it's, it's pretty bad what happens. But I kind of liked him and I wanted him to be successful, but of course he's not. But uh, yeah. Um, Alex. Does your book cover the sometimes strenuous relationship between civilian governments and the high commands? Example, Haig and Lloyd George. Yeah, yeah, we do that. We have that. Certainly in the early phases of the war, there's a lot of on the French. So you've got the French war minister, Millerand, and, uh, and the French uh, cabinet, try, the French government trying to get more, um, you know, more power and trying to actually wrest control of the war from the generals. So there's a lot about the French struggle for control of the war effort. and. Um, and that's crucial. And of course, we got Haig and Lloyd George in there. You've got that in there. So that, that that's definitely an element to it, which I think, you know, really 
complicates the picture and adds to the sort of Game of Thrones type uh, feel that you get, the pu push and pull and the change. And gradually the civilians uh, sort of reassert their control as the war goes on. Um, <clears throat> David, nice to see you in here. Um, could you say something about the German high command and its part in losing the war? For example, did the Eastern generals Hindenburg and Ludendorff lose the war because they did not understand the dynamics of the Western Front? It's a great question. Um, I think there's, there's a line that uh, as Hindenburg and Ludendorff, they've been on the Eastern Front since 1914 and they come to the Western Front in 1916. And I think they realize straight away that this is not like it is in the East. But there's a, there's a quotation from Ludendorff when they decide to attack in the West in 1918, where he says, you know, we d we're going to do it like we did in Russia. We, we, we hack a hole and the rest follows. We break the line and we get them going and then we'll finish it. Um, I'm not entirely sure that it's necessarily the Eastern Front. I think it's just Ludendorff's character. Um, you know, his character is a gambler and he wants total victory. So... You know, he has that window of opportunity and he's a gambler and he takes it. It's a disastrous decision. But these are the people I think that can't really envisage a German victory that is not total. It's like we either win or we lose. We can't, there's not like a, a middle position where we, we gain something but make some political concessions. I mean, say in Belgium or whatever. Um, but, but yeah, that, that, that's, that's, uh, that's a great question. Um, just a few more left. Um, having knocked Russia out of the war in late 1917, was Ludendorff's spring offensive in 1918 the wrong strategy for the Germans to opt? Yes, it was. It was. I, mean, I can understand why Ludendorff did it. Yeah. Um, but I think the German, what the Germans need to do in 1918 is uh, is stop and and say to the you know build their defensive lines in the West and uh, make some concessions on Belgium, make some concessions, well, maybe if the, maybe not on Alsace-Lorraine, but certainly on Belgium, if they make real political, if they essentially accept a, a, an independent Belgium, they withdraw their forces from the Western Front and they, they, they go back to 1914 borders in the West. I think it's very difficult for the Americans and the the, the British to continue fighting. It's, it would be really hard if they made that combination of a, bringing all the troops back from the East, digging in, political concessions. I think that's, that's much more difficult for the Allies um, to do. And the Germans win in the Eastern Front. Um, but, you know, this is all counterfactual. So, you know, we don't know. But clearly, it's very difficult, I think, for the Germans to win in 1918. Uh, a variety of factors, the mobility, they just don't have the power. They're up against three major powers, the Americans, the French and the British. They're just not strong enough. Um, Neil, um, what is your view of the British uh, political military relationship during the war? I think that's a great question. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things that's so friction, you know, it's so much, it's so sort of fractious and so difficult and that, you can't get over Lloyd George's war memoirs and the v version of the generals and, and the incompetence of the generals. And so it, it feels very fractious and feels very um, broken in many ways. And there's an enormous amount of problems the British have in actually working out what the generals can do, what the role of the politicians and civilians is, how far the civilians can, can go, what the generals should be doing. So I think this is inevitable in a total war. So. I'm not necessarily saying it was it was broken. I think by 1918 it's different, but I think it's very difficult to get past the just the frustrations of those involved and the absolutely terrible relations they have with each other. Robertson, Lloyd George, Haig, um, and how that's really, you know, that kind of echoes on into into the post-war years. I think. Um, Paul, should Haig have been replaced by Monash? as David Lloyd George allegedly considered. Um, of course, Monash was the you know, very decorated Australian Corps commander. I think what I'd heard um, was that he wanted to replace Haig with a, a kind of dream team of Curry, uh, Canadian, with Monash as his chief of staff, which would have been very interesting had he done that in 1918. Um, 
counterfactual, isn't it? Um, Monash had no experience. Curry had no experience of army command or of over national contingent command. So it's a huge risk to do. Um, I, I, I think other other people were safer hands. I think Pluma would have been a better choice, uh, but ultimately, uh, you know, David Lloyd George doesn't feel confident enough to, to make the change and Haig survives for long enough to get through to the end. Um, but again, the war in 1918 is very different and Haig is better when he's doing less. So when Haig is involved in alliance politics and structuring of the BEF, he's, he's pretty good. He's solid, he defends the interests of the British. When he's involved in devising the preliminary bombardment for the Somme and working out what infantry can, what infantry objectives should take, he's not very good. Um, when in 1918, he's a different commander. So I think that, I don't know whether that comes across in the book, but I certainly hope it does. Um, why do you say you tried hard to like generals? Surely you would want to be totally dispassionate. Um, yeah, I, I think you have to be, you have to try to be dispassionate. I, tr I try to like them in a sense, because I think the, the press they've had is so poor. So I think our initial response is that these, these people are incompetent and, and, and callous and, you know, they, they don't know what they're doing. So I think you have to be able to, um, you know, try and see both perspectives. And, and some I really liked, some I thought were, you know, their reputations were deserved. So again, I, I leave it up to readers to decide where they go with it. Stephen, given the success of the 100 days, how far do you explore the contribution made by the substantial increase in munitions production which contributed to the success of the 100 days? Yeah, that's in there, you know, the, the munitions stuff and the enormous, um, uh, again, not just munitions, but, you know, the amount of type of different guns, but also the kind of the things they do with the weaponry, which I think is really crucial. Um, so I talk about the, the switch to neutralizing fire by like 1917, which is really important because they, it's not just, not just they have more weaponry, they, they're using it a different way and they're using it in a much more imaginative way and a much more, um, it's much more modern in the way that they see the, the 3D battlefield and the way they try and fight in depth. Um, so. I think the, you know, the industrial, the story of the industrial revolution, if you will, the industrial chemical revolution behind the war is, is kind of a referred to obliquely. It's not a main storyline, but it's there and you can gradually see, um, certainly in the allied attacks, you know, the number of shells and guns and they just keeps increasing through the war. And that's, remarkable by 1917 the amount of stuff they can throw at the enemy defenses is just just insane um had not unrestricted u-boat warfare come about so without the american presence would the outcome of war have been the same or just taken longer for the axis to lose i think that's a really interesting one um I don't think the British and French can win without American support. I don't think they can win. Um, and they, don't, they can't win in a number of ways, but I think that the, the American involvement comes at a crucial time because when you know, the French are at their lowest ebb and the Americans enter the war. Now, clearly the Americans aren't, haven't built an army yet, but it's that lifeline that the Americans provide in the spring of 1917, which is vital. Without that, I don't see the French surviving into 1918, or at least they will collapse in 1918. Um, so again, the Americans are vital. Um, and I think that, that really needs to be emphasized. So I think, you know, the decision by the Germans to go for unrestricted submarine warfare, I think is an indication of how hard They've been pressed in 1916, and they don't want to do that again. But as a, as a strategic decision, it, it, it's cataclysmic. And of course, there's a total underestimation of the Americans. They sort of feel that they're, they're not real people. They're not, they're not going to do anything. They're just a bunch of cowboys. Uh, and Ludendorff has that, and a lot of other generals do. There's a real underestimation of the Americans. And that's 
you know, that's absolutely fatal to the German war effort. So, yeah, without the Americans, the Allies will collapse in 1918, I think. Um, Alex, what was the most enjoyable topic in the book that got you to write about? Was there anything that really challenged your preconceptions? Um, what was the most enjoyable topic? Um, I found it the, 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 the least enjoyable was writing about the stuff I've already written about. So writing about like the Battle of Passchendaele and stuff that I'd done and the hundred days in a certain degree, I, I kind of done it and I felt I'd written it. So I, I didn't want to repeat myself. So I found that most difficult. I find the most interesting, my favorite bit I think is the, um, I think my favorite bit is the, is the spring, is the sort of uh, the, the second part of the book when we're right in the middle of it and that the French try and break through. I really like, I really enjoyed that because it's a, it's a part of the war I didn't really know a lot about. So I found that really, really compelling and, uh, and really, you know, a really important part of the story of the Western front. And, and again, you know, how the allies are able to turn it around in 1918. Do you have a favorite part of the Western Front to visit today? And if so, why? Um, yeah, I mean, look, it's all special. It, it's all very, very special. Um, you know, I think, you know, I've been there many, many times. I mean, I like I like Vimy Ridge. I think Vimy Ridge is really special. I think it's a fantastic memorial. It's a fantastic place to go. Um, but I mean, Ypres is great. You know, it's a town to go to, it's fantastic. Uh, so you know that that has that town has a special, I think, place in, in I think all of our hearts who've been to the Western Front. So I think when you go there, you know you you know you've arrived. So I think Ypres is probably one of my one of my very favorite places. All right then, um, I've gone through all the Q and A questions. Um, Greg, did you have any comments or? I was just going to say that instead of typing, if there was still anybody out there in the audience that had a question they want to ask, we can go to and move to the, the raise hand function instead of getting people to, to type again. I had a question, though, for you, Nick, as you were kind of thinking and conceptualizing the book. Um, what did you use? How did you actually define the West? Because now obviously you got the book coming out on the Eastern Front and you're going to do Africa and the Middle East. So this whole kind of idea of, of what is the Western Front and then, you know, having to look at the Balkans, Salonika, Italy, you know, where, what, what kind of arguments did you have in your head as to how things were going to work as you were getting this idea of the Western Front in your mind? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I've been having that, you know, the question of, of you know, what's the Eastern, I think the Eastern, what's the Eastern Front is more of a, an obvious, well, no more of a difficult question. I think the Western Front, you've got obviously the war in France and Belgium, and that's barely self-contained. But I think the reason it's so important is because you've got, you know, four major powers locking heads there. And that's, you know, that was really, there's so much to do on the Western Front. There's so many battles, just almost constant fighting for four and a half years. So, you know, there really wasn't any room for anything else, but there's obviously elements of naval warfare and the submarine campaign, which which are very much related to the Western Front. So I didn't necessarily have a lot of debates about the Western Front. I was, it was gonna be the French, the British, the Americans, it was gonna do. I've had more debates about, you know, the Eastern Front, and it's, which essentially includes the Balkans and Italy. Um, because I think in some ways, I think the books are, this book is in some ways, it's France's war. Um, and I think with the Eastern Front, it's more like Austria-Hungary's war and the, the final volume would be more like Turkey's war. They're the states that really are the, the center of those, of those theaters. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to do the, the theater specific was, I think if you don't, like if you did maybe a book on, you know, you could do a history, the whole history of the First World War in one volume. But I think one of the drawbacks from that is you're constantly moving between fonts. So you've got, you know, what's happening on the Marne that you have to move to Tannenberg and then you have to move to, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the British in Ypres and then you have to move to Turkey and then you have to move. To, so you're constantly moving about. Whereas if you have Western Front, you have a sole focus on these individuals and the war that they fight. Um, and that's what I think is quite useful. So you're not, you know, there is mentions of what's going on in the Eastern Front, which of course, you know, it is, affects what happens in the west um but you have the consistent focus on their war and they and the way they fight it so 
you know, I, I hope if people read this, then they'll really enjoy the next volume because that's all the stuff I didn't get to talk about. And you'll actually see what happens when Ludendorff and Hindenburg are in the Eastern Front. Because they, you know, Ludendorff appears in 1914 in the book and then disappears and he suddenly appears again. So. Mm. There's a question in the chat. Had the French been overrun and had to leave the war, was it known what were the British plans? Would they continue? And what were plans of others involved? I think I think that the question depends on the time when this is. If it's 1914, I think the war's over. If the French collapse, then the British can't do anything. They just got to go to Boulogne and get the next ferry home. Um, I think if the French collapse in 1917, again, I don't suppose there are any plans. I've not come across any plans. I mean, you would have probably had some kind of level of evacuation or something. But I mean, again, considering the Supreme War Council is not created until the end of 17, and you don't have a Allied Supreme Commander until March of 1918. Um, so, you know, what happens is 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 highly dependent. The British are entirely dependent on the French for that in that sense. So. There are no plans. I think if it's in 1918, I think because of the role of the Americans, then even if the French um, really struggle, which they do by the end of the war, then the war can continue because of the American involvement. Um, but really, I think throughout most of the war, I think certainly until 1918, if the French collapse any time until 1918, I think the war is over. Um, I don't see how the British can, British can do it. The British can't do it on their own. Um, they have to have that major partner. Um, so if the French collapse, the British are facing certain defeat, I think. It's a great question. Yeah. You'd mentioned operational art and uh, kind of combined ops. I just wondered whether you'd spent any time looking at uh, particularly the kind of the last phases, joint ops. Yeah, I think, you know, that all feeds into the idea the idea of 1918 being quite different in terms of what's going on. And I think you do get a sense of the, that as or as the Germans run out of ideas by 1918, they've done the stormtroopers, they've done the infiltration tactics, they've done the short bombardments. And that's really it. They don't really know where to go. Whereas the allies are doing all kinds of crazy stuff. They're, they're, they're integrating tanks with aircraft. You know, they've got loads of that integration and that fully combined thing is where they're going, the way they can coordinate it all together um, in mobile warfare. So I think that by the end of the war, you see a real like like a gear change where things really go um, and the war ends. And of course, they got all these crazy plans for what happens in 1919, what they were going to do. But whereas I think the Germans really struggle. They, they can't really fight the war in that way. So they, they got nowhere else to go. Whereas the Allies can do all kinds of stuff if the war carries on in 1919, technologically. Sorry, I, uh, Paul has got a question for us. Yeah. Um, hello, can, can you hear? Yep. Um, on that last point, the difference surely is to do with uh, brute industrial advantage. The Germans can't do uh, Plan 1919 because they can't produce enough tanks or, or aircraft. It's surely not about um, necessarily their, their lack of um, strategic originality. But but that that's not the point I was originally going to ask. It's back to this question about um, bad choices between or, or dilemmas between the East and the Western Front. I, I have seen it argued that there was a fundamental German decision in 19, early 1916, after significant success against the Russians, to decide to go west for the Verdun campaign, uh, allegedly because Falkenhayn didn't think he could achieve a strategic result in Russia uh, in 1916. Um, but the results weren't. Yeah, I, I just got, I think you got cut off there, Paul. Um, I'll just take that if I may. I think, um, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the Falkenheim is the German Supreme Commander from September 1914. And he is focused on the West. He believes that victory will only come in the West and is not impressed by the calls to win in Russia. Doesn't think it can be done. Always believes the Russians can always retreat 
they can always evade a grand decisive battle. Uh, he puts forces into the east in 1915 because the, the Austrians are, are in real trouble. So he has to. So he, he maps a series of limited campaigns in 1915. Uh, it pushes the Russians back, essentially breaks the Russian army, goes into Serbia, conquers Serbia. And then as soon as he's free in the, in the east, he's got a free hand, he moves west and he believes that he's going to fight a new kind of battle against, um, against the French. So he's going, to, he's going to fight Verdun and break the French army at Verdun and then win. And then the plan is that then the Allies will launch a, a hurried relief offensive, which will fail badly. And then the Germans will counter the counterattack and win. That's Falkenhayn's plan, which, of course, does not work uh, because he's underestimated the French army. Um, and he's he's not capable of, of doing the level of attrition that you would need to win. But Verdun is a very, very interesting battle, which, you know, we talk about in the book. Great. Well, I think I don't see any other questions or hands coming up. So it is now approaching 20 after six. So I think uh, unless anybody charges to the fore and puts their head over the top as it were uh, i am going to thank first of all you the audience for attending here with us tonight and to uh, participating with the the book launch and then of course nick thank you and uh, daniel and nick thank you very much for for fielding the questions and presenting us with the opportunity to engage with the new book and uh, i wish you all the best of luck with the sales and the continued success of it. And uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Thanks, Greg. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, hope you have a great evening. Cheers. Take care. Stay safe. <laughs>